Hello again everyone. Welcome to this video presentation on chapter 7 and 8 from Father Crestie's book, The Church of God and Jesus Christ. These are very exciting chapters. Everyone is theologically packed. Chapter 7, The Ecclesiology of Vatican II. Uh, arguably uh, the most... Um, well, all the ecumenical councils are very significant in the history of the church. But the Second Vatican Council, the, the, the greatest uh, magnitude in terms of number of bishops, over 2,500 participating bishops from around the world, the majority of who were not from Europe and North America. Uh, and it's just um, a sui generis council in the history of the church, one of a kind, uh, in that um, the number of bishops involved, the moment in history it takes place in the 20th century following uh, two very traumatic and tragic world wars, following the Industrial Revolution and the sec right at the time of the Sexual Revolution, what's going on there around the world, uh, with changing social mores about uh, what is the human being, what is um, the purpose of sexuality within human life. And the church has to respond to all these, these things, uh, moving into the technological revolution of the 20th century now beyond, uh, and mass communication. Um, so uh, Vatican II... 16 key documents emerge from the council, and we want to think together about the meaning of this council for our understanding of class, uh, Catholic ecclesiology to this day. So we might wonder, why was this council convened? We want to think about this together. Why was this council convened by Pope John the 23rd, now a canonized saint. It's very interesting to note that uh, both the Pope who opened the council and the Pope who closed the council are now canonized saints. Pope St. Saint John the 23rd, here pictured, and then Pope St. Paul the 6th. So it says a lot about um, the significance of this council and the truthfulness of it for the church to this day. So there's two key terms we see Crestie talk about on page 88. This first Italian term, aggiornamento. Uh, we'd say in English, uh, updating, bringing up to date, up to speed with the modern world. Not, not so much the, the sense of um, uh, the church embracing modernist doctrines, which often cases are themselves heretical. So not that that's not what's going on. But the ability of the church to navigate within the waters of modernity is very important for the sake of evangelization. So other key words here will be adaptation. We read the Constitution on Sacred Liturgy. We see the language of adaptation. We have to make adaptations to liturgy. It's nothing new in the history of the church. In fact, the Last Supper is an adaptation in relation to the Jewish Feast of Passover or the Jewish Thanksgiving celebration called Toda. Uh, and all the early rites of the church uh, from Rome to Alexandria to Antioch to Jerusalem, there's adaptation, cultural adaptation happening. Another key word is inculturation, the inculturation of the gospel message so it can be received by people all over the world better and assimilated within their lives. So a giornamento is like, okay, the church can't be a museum piece in the globe, a museum piece, an uh, ancient artifact. The church has to be relevant. Uh, the church has to matter in people's daily lives. And and the and Saint John the Twenty Third and and these other bishops around the world saw this drift start to happen within the twentieth century um, uh, around the world, and not not only that a drift was 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 being anticipated, but also 
yeah, thinking about the future, how is the gospel going to continue its missionary um, uh, intention around the world in all these various continents and all these various cultures? Vatican II is at the service of the missionary destiny of the gospel. The second key word about the Second Vatican Council, a French word, ressourcement, resourcing, a kind of digging, mining within the living tradition of the church to uh, bring those gems into the light of the, especially the patristic era. What's going on in those early centuries of the church? So there's projects happening with translating and making available, making accessible as many of the church fathers' writings as possible from Greek and Latin into various other vernacular languages of the modern era, uh, French and Spanish and English and Portuguese and German and so on. Um, so this uh, making more accessible the riches of the earlier eras of the church, um, as well as everything in between, but a resourcing of the tradition in a, a cross-section kind of way. So ajournamento and resourcement. We see ajournamento is a term that communicates uh, the new and resourcement, a term that communicates the old. Both the new and the old are necessary, like Jesus said, Someone who is instructed in the kingdom of God is like the master of a house who draws from his storeroom both the new and the old. So St. John the Twenty Third said the greatest concern of this ecumenical council, Vatican II, that met from 1962 to 1965, is this, that the sacred deposit of Christian doctrine should be guarded and taught more efficaciously, more effectively, throughout the world. So that's like the main reason he calls together this council. It's a very missionary intention, and it's consciously pastoral. Um, there's no real specific heresy in the air that the church is meeting to um, uh, combat, like nothing so much in Christology. There's all the modernist stuff still in the air, you could say, that Vatican I began to deal with. Vatican II is still dealing with it, but doing so in um, yeah, a very pastoral, uh, strategic kind of way. So, we'll leave it at that. Um, so one of the documents, the longest document published by the bishops, the Fathers of the Council in 1965, is called The Pastoral Constitution of the Church in the Modern World. In Vatican I, we saw they issued a dogmatic constitution of the Church. Vatican II also issues a dogmatic constitution of the Church called Lumen Gentium, but also a pastoral constitution on the Church. And um, the first part deals with um, the currents of atheism uh, and, and growing secularism. The second part of the document uh, deals with applied issues in social ethics, things like um, the dignity of the human person, uh, the family, the political order, the economic order, the threat of war, all these different things this document is dealing with, the bishops are speaking to. It's consciously pastoral counsel with the goal of effective evangelization within the modern world. And, uh, and again, it's like there's a, there's a prophetic intuition happening at the council that times will continue to change very rapidly throughout the world. And so it's thanks to this council that the church is still alive and well throughout the world, even with priest shortage, um, even even with uh, uh, closing of so many Catholic schools, even with parish consolidation, uh, we all these things we experience in the United States 
Uh, well, in other parts of the world, there's there's a, a rapid expansion of, of Catholicism and needing to build schools and, and, and a lot more priests. So it depends where we're at in the world, what's going on in the local church. But in any case, on the whole, the church is alive and well, uh, thanks to the Second Vatican Council. And how does the church uh, want to achieve what St. John the Twenty Third said? is safeguarding the sacred deposit of faith and handing it on more effectively uh, through uh, dialogue with the modern world. So we have documents on ecumenism, that is interfaith dialogue across Christian denominations. We have documents about even interreligious dialogue, a very short document, Nostra Aetate, that is uh, a groundbreaking kind of text in the history of the church, how the church is dialoguing with Judaism, its roots that always will be, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, uh, all of these various mainstream world religions, the church wants to dialogue as the very method she embraces for evangelization. And also, um, so we think of this picture, yes, uh, a church uh, with, in the shadows of the skyscrapers, but still a church uh, in the city. This is a good image of what's happening with the Second Vatican Council. How does the church adapt to these new cultural situations without losing her identity and without losing uh, the missionary zeal and impetus uh, for... Um, uh, going out to all nations as Jesus commanded his disciples. And the church also writes in great solidarity with every person of the world. And this we see in the opening lines of uh, Gaudium et Spes, that pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world. The joys and hopes, the grief and anguish of the people of our time, especially those who are poor or afflicted, are the joys and hopes, the grief and anguish of the followers of Christ as well. And it goes on to say such beautiful things. So these are some important points about uh, the Second Vatican Council. Uh, we can think of it at page 87. Christy says, a new Pentecost. Pope John the Twenty Third saw it as this. Um, page 89, Kreshti talks about that dogmatic constitution of the church, Lumen Gentium. And it's so interesting to know that uh, when the fathers voted on the final text of this constitution, they approved it almost unanimously with only five opposing votes of those 2,300 plus bishops who were voting. And it's a biblical, liturgical, and a patristic approach to the church rather than a merely legalistic or canonical one. There's still the canonical um, truths there, uh, but, but there's this resourcing happening of let's get back to uh, all of the, the biblical typology about the church and this rich understanding of the church that involves many models of understanding the church. There's a great quote on page 91 from Lumen Gentium, chapter, or not chapter, paragraph 8, where we read that um, the Church of Christ, set up and organized in this world as a society, subsists in the Catholic Church. Although outside its structure, many elements of sanctification and of truth are to be found, which as proper gifts to the Church of Christ impel towards Catholic unity. Okay? So the relationship with the, the one only Catholic and Apostolic Church, whose Pope is in Rome, um, and all these other Protestant churches, and even Orthodox churches, um, there's many elements of sanctification and truth found, which as proper gifts to the Church of Christ impelled towards a Catholic unity. But outside the, the Catholic Church structure, these uh, elements of sanctification and truth can be found, not in their fullness, um, but it's only in the Catholic Church, the fullness of sanctification and truth subsists. It's a really important line 
from Lumen Gentium. Another thing that's quite revolutionary uh, of the Second Vatican Council on page 92, we read Krashti talking about um, the laity. Whereas uh, the traditional definition of lay persons in the 1917 Code of Canon Law uh, was, was purely negative in that anyone is a lay person who is neither a cleric nor religious. In the updated 1983 Code of Canon Law, uh, published by uh, Pope St. John Paul II, we have much more said about the laity. So if we refer to the Code of Canon Law, paragraph uh, 204, Canon 204, I should say. Let's have a look at this. Okay, Code of Canon Law. Canon 204, section 1, the Christian faithful are those who, inasmuch as they have been incorporated in Christ through baptism, have been constituted as the people of God. That's a big name for the church in Lumen Gentium. For this reason, made sharers in their own way in Christ's priestly, prophetic, and royal function, they are called to exercise the mission which God has entrusted to the church to fulfill in the world in accord with the condition proper to each. So um, all the baptized are called to share in the mission of the church. All the baptized, clergy and laity alike, are made sharers in the priestly, prophetic, and royal office of Jesus. Another important canon on this topic Canon 208 and following. So if we move further uh, into the code together, not there. Uh, let's go to this 208 and following. Here we go. Um, the obligations and rights of all the Christian faithful. From their rebirth in Christ, there exists among all the Christian faithful, clergy and laity alike, a true equality regarding dignity and action by which they all cooperate in the building up of the body of Christ according to each one's own condition and function. So this is, this is so amazing. All the Christian faithful are included in, in Canon 211, have the duty and right to work so that the divine message of salvation more and more reaches all people in every age and every land. Canon 212, we think about the relationship between pastors and all the faithful. Conscious of their own responsibility, the Christian faithful are bound to follow with Christian obedience those things which the sacred pastors, inasmuch as they represent Christ, declare as teachers of the faith or establish as rulers of the church, especially, namely, the bishops, uh, but also the pastors of parishes. Uh, that next section, Christian faithful are free to make known to the pastors of the church their needs, especially spiritual ones and their desires. Uh, canon, uh, we'll go on to the next section. According to the knowledge, competence, and prestige which they possess, they, meaning especially the laity, have the right, even at times the duty to manifest to the sacred pastors their opinion on matters which pertain to the good of the church, to make their opinion known to the rest of the Christian faithful without prejudice to the integrity of faith and morals with reverence to their pastors and attentive to common advantage and dignity of persons. Um, so, all of this being said, the laity have an integral role in the life of the church and her missionary um, mandate from Christ. Uh, and Lumen Gentium chapter 5 talks about the universal call to holiness of all the faithful, uh, not just clergy and religious. So it's, it's really um, uh, groundbreaking uh, development of doctrine in the life of the church. Uh, these new um, layers within the tradition are coming to surface, uh, and it's, it's such a wonderful thing. So again, I encourage you to read uh, Lumen Gentium in full, uh, Gaudium et Sippe is a bit longer, but if you, you, you can uh, get a chance, if you haven't already, to read these uh, Vatican II documents in full. 
Um, they're all online. You can uh, peruse especially the 16 major documents of the council. Finally, on page 94, chapter 7, Koresh talks about the Blessed Virgin Mary. And it's interesting, the Second Vatican Council, there was discussion, should they issue a document just on the, the Blessed Virgin Mary, which they could have done, uh, but they did not do that. The Fathers of the Council decided to incorporate um, the most extensive theological treatment of the Blessed Virgin Mary at the end of Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution of the Church. Um, and so re-emphasizing uh, her immaculate conception that Mary is model and mother of the Church, um, queen and mother. So then chapter 8 of Kreshti, going into what about after Vatican II, um, the ecclesiology following the council. And just make a few short points here, which are really important because it brings us up to speed with where we are in the history of the church. Um, there's a great quote from French Dominican theologian Yves Congar on page 95 in the footnotes. Uh, so I draw your attention to that. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read it and comment on it, but um, I, I would encourage you to make sure to read footnote 1, page 95 of Kreshti. But what I do want to comment on more specifically on 96, this quote from Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, where he talks about the Second Vatican Council is uh, a council in which Faith is seeking intellectus. It's a classic um, definition, St. Anselm of Canterbury in the 11th century. What is theology? Fides querens intellectum, faith seeking understanding. That's what Vatican II is about. Faith seeking understanding within the modern world. But what happens following the council is the sad reality that happens with most things human. There's a, It's uh, ensconced by a political hermeneutic. That means people want to interpret the council as liberal or conservative, to put it straightforward, but, but that those political proclivities to the right or to the left, and people want to interpret only in these terms. But good Catholic theology does not begin there whatsoever and, and wants to transcend these political reductionisms, because that's what they are in truth. The problem with ideology, a political ideology, is it wants to reduce the whole to some parts over here or some other parts over there. And Catholicism, when we look at the social teaching of the church, for example, it considers all the issues that pertain to the dignity of the human person, the flourishing of society, and it says yes to everything genuinely human and divine. It doesn't pick and choose. Uh, so this is an important thing to realize when we think about Vatican II. We need to prevent it from being politicized even in our own time today. People that reject the council and say they're Catholic, that is not a Catholic thing to do whatsoever. <laughs> Sorry, it's an ecumenical council and the Holy Spirit guided these bishops um, to think what they thought, to write what they wrote. All the deliberations that happen and the, and the, the, the most faithful implement, implement, implementation of the council. Uh, yes, sometimes it's not implemented well, largely because of the obstacles involved in politicizing it and political hermeneutics. So... We have to continue to commit toward the whole, to think toward the whole, to live toward the whole. This is Catholicism. And so we want to get at the question, what is the real counsel of the Fathers, Kreshti says, on 96? But we see some beautiful things happen uh, in the years since the council. Uh, on page 98, we read about the mutual... Uh, lifting of the 1054 excommunications between the Patriarch of Constantinople and um, the, the Bishop of Rome. And this is in 
the year 1964, as the Second Vatican Council is taking place, still, quote, Paul VI um, went on pilgrimage to the Holy Land to meet with Patriarch Athenagoras of Constantinople to ask forgiveness of sins committed by Catholics. The two embraced on the Mount of Olives, recited together the Our Father, lifted the mutual excommunications between Constantinople and Rome that go back to the 1054 schism of the Eastern Orthodox churches and the Roman Catholic Church. So it's not that they became one, but they at least lifted the mutual excommunications a very symbolic and necessary gesture. And then later in 2016, Pope Francis uh, met with the Kiro, the Patriarch of Moscow and all of Russia, in Cuba uh, in um, February of 2016. So that these kind of things are happening, these ecumenical movements toward and promoting Christian unity is very good, very important. As Pope Francis says, we read on page 100 of Kreshti, he talks about an ecumenism of blood because all denominations have their martyrs at the hands of each other. And so... Um, we let the blood of the martyrs speak that call us toward peace, that call us toward unity, and um, no longer um, this violence toward the religious other. Um, 102, um, we see mention of an integral liberation theology, which is a very careful term in Catholic theology, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith issued two different documents about liberation theology. One, speaking of it um, in a very concerned way, um, pointing out necessary to point out all the negative aspects uh, under that general term liberation theology, but another text uh, highlighting the very important points that come um, with um, uh, the faithful aspects of liberation theology in general. Um, and so there was a joint publication on liberation theology uh, by the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, Gerhard Ludwig Müller, and Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, the father of, known as the father of liberation theology, D Dominican, Peruvian uh, theologian and priest. Um, so these kind of things are important. We think of Pope Francis. Um, Querida Amazonia, his uh, apostolic uh, exhortation following the um, synod on the church in the Amazon. So again, some amazing things happening um, um, with this uh, missionary impulse of the church around the world. The last point I'd like to make then, so much content here in these chapters. Page 104, um, Crestry, going back to those terms that characterize the Second Vatican Council, not only as giornamento, but also and always resource mount. Um, and a, a quote from De Lubac on habit and routine, uh, page 104, habit and routine have an unbelievable power to waste and destroy. Again, the need for the church uh, always to uh, reform, uh, semper reformanda, um, and a necessary ongoing critique of a bureaucratic status quo way of being church um, in which habits and routine uh, can, can hypnotize and make um, all the faithful sleepwalk without um, this impassioned um, desire to share the gospel with everyone. Uh, and St. Paul VI said the church exists to evangelize. Uh, and so these chapters on the Second Vatican Council and its aftermath really get us back um, uh, to the missionary identity of the church and uh, much more on this to come. So thanks so much for thinking together on Kareshti chapter 7 and 8.